welcome to worship this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad of it. And turn your attention to the announcements. Let's start with one from Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Good morning. Uh, let's do a show of hands. How many of you plan to eat supper at some point this week? If you only pick one you day, do so this Saturday, February 8th. We're starting at 4.30 at the Home of Ed and Karen for wonderful hors d'oeuvres, appetizers, as my mother jokingly calls them, horse dippers. <laughs> then we're, we're moving to the Fellowship Hall of the Church for lasagna and garlic bread. Yum. And then... We are going not to my home, but to the home of the East House Art Gallery, um, which is an adjoining property, and have decadent desserts and a sneak peek at the upper level of the art gallery. We're still working on renovating the lower level. Um, hope that everybody can come. Please let Karen, Sally, or myself know before you leave church today so we can make sure we have enough food for everybody and perk up these older days of winter. Thank you, Cindy. That was wonderful. Um, I turn, another announcement. Don't forget, Sunday, February 23rd, after we're going to have, after worship, we're going to have a lunch. A free will donation that will go toward Misty's police trip. And then we're going to stay and play games. Again, sometimes the winter gets long. Does that sound like fun, the alley? The alley's moving her head along here, so... Plan to join, it, or join us for that. And if you're interested in joining our church, please let myself or the church office know. Now, I only have one other announcement that I nearly forgot. It's not only Groundhog's Day, but it's at least one person's birthday today. Mary Gold, happy birthday. <laughs> and the Groundhog did see a, no, he did, he did, he did not. not see a shadow, which really means nothing, but he can not sound like it does, so. Let's sing happy birthday to her, shall we? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh. 
seems like a long time away, and it'll be much warmer then, and where we go, it will be even warmer. Um, we are preparing again for our mission trip to Belize, and I know that you've all been very generous in helping us to, to raise our funds. Um, I'm here to ask for a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, starting this year, we can no longer buy our medical supplies in the United States and take them with us. Um, we had quite a problem getting them through customs last year. So it means that everything has to be bought within the country of Belize. I have started on a list that we submit to a supplier in Belize, and we hope we can get what's on the list. Um, already half of that has been cut because they don't have it right now. Um, so the first thing I'm asking for is prayers that our supplier will be able to get the medications that we need. The other thing that we're asking for is if any of you feel so led to give donations, we have um, two cans in the back um, entryways um, that we're collecting donations. Because we cannot buy them at cost in the United States, it's going to cost us more to get our supplies. Um, so I'm asking for your prayers and your donations. Um, as we prepare, prepare for our trip to Belize, um, we're going June 13th through the 20th this year. How should they make checks off? Uh, checks can be made to the Belize Mission Fund. Um, we have an account at Great Western Bank that I deposit them in, and then our bookkeeper is actually moved to Colorado now, so I let them know um, what funds we have. Um, just this week, I placed about a $4,200 order um, to Belize. Um, they got about two-thirds of that, um, so we're going to try in another month and resubmit and see what we can get. Thank you, Peggy. Okay, kids, are you ready? How long have I been here? A long time. More than eight years. More than eight years! Now, some people noticed. Some of you did. But some people never said one word. Right? We should do our best. We should come to Sunny School. 
We've had talks at home about how we should comb our hair before we come to church, right? But it, it's not about us, is it? We're going to be talking this morning about pride, and that's what pride is. Pride is when everything has to do with you. When you're focused on you and you and you and you. And Jesus talks in the book of Matthew to the Pharisees, and he says, when they stand out on the street and they pray loud so everybody can know some, right? And Jesus says, you don't have to do everything so everybody can see. It's not all about you. It's about Jesus. And Jesus tells us that if we want to be great, we've got to be a servant. But sometimes servants do things that nobody knows, right? Maybe they pick up dirty socks. Maybe they come in the sanctuary and they pick up the, the everything that's left behind, right? learn at me, why? A servant is somebody who does things and doesn't, doesn't worry about who notices. They just do it because it needs to be done, don't they? And Jesus says we should do that. It's not all about us, but it's all about who? It's all about God. And if we want people to look up to us, if we want them to say, hey, she really knows Jesus, then we need to not look down on them, right? I didn't pick on everybody else here because they didn't have to hair today, did I? No. All right, let's pray. So the gracious God, remind us that it's not all about us. It's really all about you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these children. Bless us and help us to focus only on you. Amen.
that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The lion was proud of his mastery of the animal kingdom, and one day he decided to make sure all the other animals knew he was the king of the jungle, and he was so confident that he bypassed the smaller animals and went right to the bear. Who is the king of the jungle? The lion asked. The bear replied, why, you are, of course. The lion gave a mighty roar of approval. Next he asked the tiger, who is the king of the jungle? And the lion quickly responded, everyone knows that you are, mighty lion. Next on the list was the elephant, and the lion faced the elephant and addressed his question, who is the king of the jungle? And the elephant immediately grabbed the lion with his trunk, whirled him around in the air five or six times, and slammed him into a tree. Then he pounded him into the ground several times, dumped him underwater in a nearby lake, and finally dumped him out on the shore. The lion, beaten, bruised, and battered, struggled to his feet. He looked at the elephant through sad and bloody eyes and said, Look, just because you don't know the answer is no reason to get mean about it. <laughs> and we know that pride can lead us into a lot of trouble. Several years ago, I heard a a series on the radio titled, What Keeps Me From Growing In, which Girl Kroll investigates the 10 most common temptations Satan uses to keep you and I from a thriving relationship with God. And I'm using that series, as I said before, as a, that series of teachings as a springboard for my own sermon series. And today's topic, as you might have guessed, is pride. Now, left unchecked, pride will destroy you. And much like the lion, pride can cause us and the people around us much pain. Now, much like anger, there is a good kind of pride and there is a bad kind of pride. The bad kind of pride, the kind, the kind that God hates, arises from our own self-righteousness. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. That's Proverbs 8, 13. This kind of pride comes from the Hebrew word gava, which means haughtiness or arrogance in an evil way. There are at least four New Testament words for pride, with each having a slightly different meaning. One word means insolent or arrogant, as in James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Another word means to boast, as in Philippians, Ephesians excuse me, 2, 9, that tells us our salvation is not earned, but given by God's grace, free grace that lest anyone should boast. And there are two other words, all generally used in a negative context. The wrong kind of pride draws all the attention to ourselves, right? It's all about the blue hair. It's all about you noticing me, right? That kind of pride wants recognition for ourselves. That kind of pride separates us from God. But there is a good kind of pride as well. Pride is good when we have pride in God, in who God is and what he's done. But let he, him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. That's Jeremiah 9, 24. And 1 Corinthians 1, 31 says, Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Pride is good when we have Pride in others. I have great confidence in you, Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. It's the kind of pride that does not arise from sex, self exaltation, haughtiness, or conceit and presumption. That's a holy pride. That's not a haughty pride. Pride's good even when your pride is good in yourself if you're glorifying God in your emotions. And in your motives and in your actions. It's pride you have when your dad is honored as a long-term volunteer. It's pride when your first grader comes home with a gold star on his paper, right? Oh my gosh, my child is getting their spelling words, right? You're proud. What do you do with that? You hang it on the, you hang it on the bridge, right? You're proud. It's good to take pride in our work. We say, am I, am I proud of my work? work. I've been, we've been talking to kids about that. We're supposed to do the very, very best that we can in all tasks and assignments. One of the things I hate is when people just slop, 
slot for everything, right? Do your best. There is such a thin line between feeling confident because you rely on God and God's promises and God's power and becoming proud because you have been used by God for great purposes, right? King David, if you want to read about this in 1 Chronicles 21, King David discovers this when he, he decides to take a census of Israel. Now, there's a census in the book of Numbers that God had ordered, and that census was taken, but this census, the second Chronicles, was taken so David can take pride in the strength of his army. In counting his troops, David is beginning to trust more in military power than in God. And as I said, you can read about that more in 1 Chronicles 21. But today, of course, we're going to be talking about that kind of pride that's not godly, but the kind of pride that causes us to stumble and fall into sin. I think mean, pride is such a deceitful sin, right? Many people who are infected and infested with pride would have no idea that they are, right? As a matter of fact, have you ever known somebody who's so proud, they're proud of their humility, right? I'm so proud. <laughs> I'm so proud that I did 15 years of perfect attendance. Well, Larry said that to me, and I thought, did I really not miss one Sunday in 15 years? I'm not so sure about that, right? Okay. But I got my pin, right? And it's saying, you know what? I'm very proud. Pride is, is conceit, it's arrogance, it's superiority. I'm superior because of this. That kind of pride, again, is based on self centeredness. It's destructive. It is, have you ever known someone like that? And it, what will it do to our relationships? It is highly destructive, isn't it? Because, you know what, the opposite of loving others is not hating them, but it's rather being so self-centered that you never love them or never think about them at all. Now, some of the indications of a proud person, a proud person becomes irritated when corrected for mistakes. A proud person accepts praise over things over which he or she has no control. Have you ever had a boss like that? They don't, they don't do any of the work themselves. You're the one who does it, and yet they're the one who brags to everybody about how wonderful it is, right? Pride doesn't admit mistakes. Pride refuses to take counsel and to learn from other people. Nope, I already know how to do it. I don't need help. Right? That's being proud. Pride also shows itself in competition with other people. Pride doesn't want more. It wants more than somebody else. Why? You know, if Sally has a pin, I want, I want one more year than Sally has. Right? Okay? And pride believes, again, that the world revolves around me. Now, there was a politician, I'm not thinking of politicians here, okay? Politicians attended a picnic. He attended a picnic with his constituents in his home district, and he made the rounds visiting with people, and it was time to fill up his plate for lunch, and he went and got all the side dishes, and then he went to the woman serving the fried chicken, and he said, do you think I could get a second piece of fried chicken? And she said, no. And he was surprised to be turned down, and so he said, do you know who I am? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. You are the congressman for our district. And she said, do you know who I am? He said, no, I do not. And she said, well, I am a chicken lady. <laughs> so move on down the line. <laughs> now, all of us, all of us have been fools at times for pride, right? It's destructive again because it gives us a false sense of superiority. It even pride even shames other people. It humiliates themselves to make you feel better. You know, if you notice, when people are struggling with low self-esteem, they will often make themselves feel better at the expense of others, right? Sometimes I think that's why people like to watch some of these zany, the zany stuff on TV, because you watch it and go, oh my gosh, my life is so much better than these people, right? And you know what? When it, you also fall in prayer when you desperately begin to crave the affirmation of other people. And you want people to like you so much that you will do, you will do anything. If your prime motivation is to get other people's affirmations, that will influence you, it's going to influence you, to do things that will benefit you rather than to do the right thing. Now, if you've achieved some success and accomplishment in life and you feel affirmed, you might begin to believe all the nice things that people say about you, right? Because there are some people, I would say, there are some people that like you so much, if you, if you committed murder in front of them, they, just, they say that in heaven, right? You ever know people like that? They like you so much and you, you can't do anything wrong in their eyes. There's also the flip side, right? People who don't like you and never think you do anything right. But when that happens, you, be, you believe you're really, I'm really somebody. 
I deserve a second piece of chicken. Or you begin to think, hey, you know what? There's rules. Those are for the other, the other people. See, or God calls people to serve him, but no, nah, I don't have to. At that point, we're forgetting that we are sheep in his pasture. It's pretty soon, I guess, if we're thinking, hey, we must be really great. But remember the words of wise King Solomon. He said, let another praise you and not your own mouth. That's Proverbs 27, 2. Pride is really destructive because it begins to lure us and it like reels us into thinking that we can live well and intently of God. We can go alone. It makes us believe we don't need God. Now, we know that's not only foolish, but we've proven time and time and time and time and time and time, and time again that that's not true. Let's look at some portions from Psalm 10. In the first verse, the psalmist questions why God hides himself in times of trouble, and then he describes the wicked this way. Listen to this. The wicked boasts about the cravings of his heart. He, he blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked person does not seek God. In all his thoughts, listen to this. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. He says to himself, God will never notice. Right? When you are so full of thinking about yourself, what you need, what you want, what people think of you, how all those things, God gets crowded out. And again, I think that's the most destructive thing about pride, is that it minimizes our belief in our need for God in our lives. Pride can also cause us to take credit when credit is due to God. Now, remember Samson. He was born as a result of God's plan in the lives of Manoah and his wife. Samson was to do a great work for God, to take, to take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, to, you may remember the story from Sunday school, right? To, to help him accomplish God's plan, God gave Samson one thing. What did he get? He was, whoa, right? He was buff. He was strong, okay? And if we read Judges 15, we see Samson's pride himself. He boasts of his own strength. He says, with a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Now, later, Samson asked God to refresh him because of his accomplishments, and when you use your spiritual gifts and see the impact it has for the kingdom of God, you can be proud of that. You can be proud of that because it is a gift of God. It's God who's accomplished, who's able to accomplish all that through you. But when people recognize your gifts, always give the credit to the giver, Almighty oh God, and glorify him with it. I just thought about the fact that he glorified him as hair. Remember, I'm like, how oh, perfect that I talked about him <laughs> and wore the blue hair today, right? He was so proud of himself, and we know that he came, he came to his own demise. Right? <clears throat> You've got to remember, we have to remember, that it's God that's blessed us with every single thing we have. We have to remember that God has blessed us with gifts, abilities, God's given us the very breath we have. So our pride is always going to be counterbalanced with an appropriate amount of humility. Now, I gave you another one of these sheets, a baker's dozen of verses about pride. Check these out when you get home. There's lots of verses about pride in the Bible, okay? One of the ones we know is Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goes before what? Goes before a fall. Pride goes before destruction, a high spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Isaiah 14, 22 tells us that for those who defy God, there is nothing ahead but disaster. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts, and will cut them off from Babylon, name and remnant, descendants and pos posterity, declares the Lord. You know, sometimes people are so filled with themselves and their pride that they cannot, they cannot admit that they need a Savior. Pride really essentially keeps them out of heaven. They don't miss heaven because of a lack of knowledge. They miss it because of their own stubborn pride. Now, if we're going to be truthful here, we have to admit that we all struggle with pride. It's a perpetual nagging temptation. Because you know what? That's what our culture says. What does our culture say to us? When I get a sandwich, I ought to have it whose way? My way. My way. If I don't like pickles, there better not be a pickle on my sandwich. <laughs> right? Yeah. What cheese or no cheese, Tony? No cheese, Tony says. Oh my gosh, you know, what would happen if we accidentally got a pickle on our sandwich? The horror of it all, right? But it's that that causes us, our culture tells us we've got to have it exactly the way we think we ought to have it. 
where it also causes us to connect every experience and every conversation with ourselves. In a sense, pride is the sin beneath every other sin because at its core, pride is really worshiping yourself. Now what makes pride so dangerous is it can be subtle and pervasive and sometimes undetectable. And it's very effective ways about blinding self-awareness. And even those who seem to be the least prideful of people, people quietly paralyzed by low self-esteem, anxiety, and worry can actually be full of pride. Now, no surprise, in order to develop true humility, we have to take the focus off of ourselves entirely because true humility means we stop connecting every experience and every conversation with ourselves. For example, when someone else is upset, do you think, what have I done? What did I do? What did I say? Sometimes I think to myself, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Maybe something else is going on in their life. Often that's true. I think about when Ed worked at CDS and I was like, how can people get mad over magazines? <laughs> right? People call them and they're irate because they don't get their magazines. That's thinking about themselves. That's what they're really, they're really not angry about the magazine, are they? You know, to put it another way, Tim, Timothy Keller says that the essence of humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It's thinking of myself less. Let's do that again. It's not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. Humility is thinking of myself less. And the only way to take our focus off of ourselves is to be totally enraptured by something else. To break our pride, we've got to fix our eyes on God and bask in His beauty and His splendor. True humility is the necessary condition of not only seeing God, but accepting His grace in Jesus Christ. You know, no one stands, at the, stands before God looking down at their nose. Nobody stands at the cross with their chest puffed out and says, Oh my gosh, I did it. Because before God, we, like Abraham, realized we're mere dust and ashes. We have nothing to be proud of, and that gives us the humility we need. And our true position before God is that of a dependent child. And the good news is that Christ's work on the cross is perfect and it's complete. It's lacking nothing. In Christ, God accepts us and loves us on the basis of his perfect life and sacrificial death. Now, those, that truth crucifies any reason for pride as if we had one in the first place. Now, I don't know about you, but hearing that the work of Christ is complete and done, and it's not about me, that takes a weight off. You know, I don't have to sit around, I don't have to compare myself to other Christians, to other pastors, to other mothers. I don't have to sit there and go, oh my gosh, if you were a really good pastor, you'd have a thousand people, right? I don't say that to myself. Oh my gosh, if you were a really good mother, you were telling an elaborate birthday parties and take 50 kids to your house for two days and hide things in the yard and make home and treats and, okay? I don't have to say that. I don't have to prove, I don't have to prove myself. I don't have to prove that I'm worthy of God's love. I don't have to prove that I'm worthy of the love of anybody else. I don't have to compete. I don't have to self-promote. And you know what? You don't have to either. You and I are beloved children of God, not for our own merit, not for our own worth, but God's love is free, and it is me. And today, as we remind ourselves of who we truly are, maybe we rest completely in the love of God, knowing that it's all about who He is. Amen. As we come to a time of joy, there's one thing that I, I made an error in, um, Marlis is not having surgery now, so we're, we're glad she's playing this morning and, and praying for her, but not that she, the surgery's been postponed for a while. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? Yes, Kathy. The YMCA fundraiser for Ruby last week, we heard it um, raised over $5,000. Wow. Served over 300 meals, and just the volunteers were, it was just great. It was a great day. Wonderful. I'm so glad that things went well at the Y with Rudy. I know he's still at home. Rudy Kennard is at home. He needs to stay away from germs. But $5,000 raised is wonderful. Praying for him as he does the bone marrow transplant. Are there others here? I know somebody else raised their hand. Yes, Wayne. My deliverer. Oh, yes. Um, Wayne wants someone to deliver. Is it? Is it every 
the video ever, is it every week? No, just just this week. Oh, just, just this week. Just tomorrow. Someone to deliver the video this, yeah. this week to the people. My deliverer is ill. Okay, your deliverer is ill. So talk to Wayne afterwards about that. Thank you. Is there somebody else? Okay. Yeah, let us know the Lord and pray together. Oh, holy and gracious one, we, we come to you, first of all, thanking you and praising you for who you are. We thank you that you are holy and just. We thank you, Lord, that in you, every all the work is complete. The work is finished, and we have been redeemed and loved and forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And all that's happened through the cross, Lord. We thank you that we don't have to compete, that we don't have to try to prove to you who, who we are or how wonderful we are. You know us. You love us completely. Again, not because of what we've done, but because of who we belong to. And we belong to you, Lord. Thank you for that. We thank you for gathering us together this morning. We thank you for the beautiful day that it is outside. We thank you for this wonderful day of worship. We thank you for gathering us together in this church building. We thank you for all who gathered here this morning. And for the blessing of being together to worship your holy name. We ask that you just continue to help us focus and focus less on ourselves, Lord, and more on who you are. And as we do that, we will be continue to be freed of the, of the sin of pride. We thank you for that. Lord, we lift up to you today those who are in need of your tender loving care. We think of those who are struggling with cancer. We think of Doug and Rhonda, for Bob and Paul and Rudy. We thank you for a successful fundraiser with the wife of Rudy. We pray for him, especially as he um, at some point prepares to have a bone marrow transplant. Keep it well. Keep it safe. Be with him bar. Uh, put your hand, loving touch, Lord, upon others who are struggling in body, mind, and soul today. We think of those who are struggling with cancer. We think of those who are struggling with serious illness such as ALS and Alzheimer's. We think of those, Lord, who are struggling with mental illness. We ask, Lord, that we would look up, that we would focus less on ourselves and more on not only you, but the people around you. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us to be your hands and your feet, that we would be your, your caring ministry, carry out your caring ministry in this world. Lord, we lift up to you um, others today, those who are in nursing homes and assisted living, and we think of Mary Ann and Marilyn, for Shirley and Odette, for Bud and Dolores, for Merlin and Velma and Pat. We know there are others, Lord, and we, we lift them up to you this day, and we ask that they would not be lonely or feel afraid, but that they would feel your powerful presence with them. Again, we thank you, Lord, for this, this time together this morning, and we just lift up all these prayers in your precious name. Amen. Friends, we come offering our gifts to God, not because we must, but because our God has been so good to us. Let's bring forth our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
talents, our abilities, our resources, our very lives, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we are part of your mission and ministry on this earth, and we thank you for these gifts. Use them to glorify your name and your name alone. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Day in and day out, people come to me with these words, I'm hungry. <laughs> now, you may think that that's only words I hear at home, or even during the passing of a piece when someone comes up and tells me they're hungry. But I hear that from many in our church and our community. We are hungry. We're hungry for God. We're hungry for peace. We're hungry for hope. Jesus reminds us that hunger can only be satisfied with. Through him, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Friends, this table is the place where our thirst and our hunger will be satisfied. Let's join together in singing, let us break bread together. Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
Jesus, we see you. We thank you that you have given us this wonderful sacrament to gather us together. We thank you, Lord, that you have a great and unending love for us. Thank you for all you've done in us, and we pray that we would be your servants, that we would humbly serve those, all the people we meet, and that as we leave this place today, we would go out of here with such a joy and enthusiasm that it would affect the world. We pray all this in your powerful name. Amen. Friends, let's join together in singing our final hymn, Amazing Grace.